All right, should we? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really interested to see what like Zoom culture is like across the, the world. But in, uh, in our group, we, we use a stack system um, for sort of asking and responding to questions. Um, I think that might work here. So kind of generally the way, the way it works is that if you, if you have a question or you'd like to respond to something, if you just type stack into the chat, I'll keep track of like, who's, who's next to speak. Um, that's just the way we've been doing it in our group uh, for, for like sort of larger meetings and it works pretty well. Um, and then if you have something that you'd like to respond to like urgently, just, Throw it in the throw it in the chat, and as facilitator, I'll I'll sort of like work it work it into the stack as necessary. Does that does that work for everybody? Sounds good to me. Awesome. Thanks for doing that, Jake. Of course. Um. Yeah. Do Do we want to start by going around and asking everybody who's here what they want to hear, know about, or talk more about? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, so let's just do, let me switch my view. Um, maybe do just like a real quick around the horn. Um, introduce, um, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Jacob. I'm working with Flatbush United Mutual Aid on the bulk buying side of it, sort of getting all of the, the wholesaling in order, um, figuring out how we do our, our spec sheets for packing, and the, the logistics, like the, the real world, like physical logistics ends of, end of things. Um, and I'll pass that to Amy. Hi, I'm Amy, and I also work on Flatbush United, uh, less on the tech side, definitely, but really looking at how we train our volunteers to use the tool and connect to our neighbors who may be in need of food resources. <clears throat> and then also looking at how we assign, how we map and cluster the different deliveries um, and how that relates to how many drivers and packers we have. So also the logistics side on the weekends. And Eric? And I am also from Flatbush United. Uh, it's the neighborhood I live in and I happen to also be a Civi CRM techie who just happened to end up uh, in the middle of a chaotic situation and figured I'd throw some good tech at it. Um, but really the work that, that Jake and Amy and everybody else is doing is uh, the real work, the organizing um, and the, the creativity that they brought into the project and the way that the different talents and experiences of different people came into brainstorming out an idea, which they then sort of prototyped um, in Google, uh, just to give an idea of what the forms were, what the process could be. And then I was able to build out uh, this system very quickly because of the, the foundation that they had laid and the then we've gone through a series of iterations going back and forth where further refinement of the tool is being based on the actual use of the tool. Um, and we're about to make a big change in data model in order to respond to them. Um, but I just wanted to give them the credit the that we're not techies uh, is, is just to cover um, the, the, uh, the project planning and, uh, ability to spec something out and understand the data. Uh, that's, that's techie too. Um, so that's my long introduction. I will uh, pass to um, Bruno next. Sorry, I'm munching guys. I'm, it's almost dinner time here in the UK. I'd be normally eating right now. So um, I'm business development manager for Circle Interactive. Circle is one of the largest um, CV developers in the UK. I'm quite new to the community. Um, I've only been working with Circle for just under six months now, which means I'm still 
um, understanding how it works in a way, even though I'm selling it, which means I, yeah, I do understand the basics of it by now and, um, and I use it as well, obviously. I became interested to, to learn more about what you guys did because it does sound like a fairly complex use of Civi, perhaps more complex than, than I've seen uh, closely. Um, with any of our clients, I'm more involved in projects that, although, yeah, they have certain element, a, a, a certain element of complexity, I quite like how your um, use of it goes from the digital world to the physical world in a big, big way. So I think that's, that's probably the most interesting and attractive thing about, about the way you've been doing it. And I think the key word uh, that Eric said is creativity, because you just took this this um, system that's kind of a, you can use any, use it for anything and you've done something that's large scale and like I said, goes on to the physical world. So kudos, that's really interesting. Um, and you guys sound like you're doing a lot of good. So look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. Pick someone to introduce themselves next, Bruno. Yes, hi, this is Thorsten from Leipzig in Germany. Um, yes, we, we started in March with the Corona help activity and we brought together about 200 people needed help with volunteers. Um, we used um, geomatching, geocoding that was very helpful to get people close to where they live, but it was a lot of cut and paste. <laughs> We used CV activities to bring those people together. And that's why I heard this CV case. We didn't get into the complexity of CV case. Um, now at the moment, it's more and more open here, fortunately, but there's a fear of the second corona wave, corona wave so to say, and we would like to be prepared um, to be more efficient because current pace, we we simply brought them together. It's not that in CV case we had like lists what somebody would need to buy in the grocery store or so. We just got the people together and then they called each other and then they decided what they would need to do, when to show up and, and how, how, to bring, how it works for the money or so. We, we, we gave them some tips, but it was on behalf of them how they would um, make it happen in a way. So yeah, CV case, if, if, that's my basic question. Is there an easy way <laughs> to, 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 to reduce the number of cut and paste and to go away from our 15 minutes per case to say five, just by, um, yeah, just by using CV case. I, I, I would enter, I might enter in, in the chat um, a link where, Unfortunately, everything could only be read in German <laughs> language, but there, there you see a little workflow that, that we used and which we would, which would we like to automate. Thanks. So let's see, I'll, I'll just pick somebody to go next. William, give us an introduction and what do you want to know? Hi, so I'm William. I'm based in Newcastle in the north of England and uh, I work for an arts membership organisation with a national membership organisation for visual artists in the UK. Um, so we use Civic CRM in a very different way from the way you're using it, um, but I'm just interested to hear more about what you're doing because um, your introduction earlier sounded fascinating. But that's me. And I'll pick Joe. Go next. Hi, I'm the only Joe. So I'm Joe McLaughlin. <clears throat> I'm in Irvine, California. Um, I did a little bit of work with a group uh, uh, nearby in Riverside County, California, uh, the Democratic Socialists of America, the Inland Empire, and helped them set up uh, a, a new city instance. And we did a very basic um, uh, call list and scheduling using web form, so CRM, 
and call through the group's uh, contact list to ID folks looking for support and to check in. Um, and I'm particularly interested in hearing about Eric and Jacob and Amy, uh, any integration you might have created between, you mentioned Airtable, uh, the org was using, maybe still be using, or was using it first in Google Forms and Slack. If any of that stuff is integrated with what you developed, uh, I work with an organization actually based in New York called the Working Families Party that's been using Airtable uh, and Slack and other stuff for kind of volunteer management. Uh, and I'm eager to, to um, hear more about that. Thanks so much. Uh, Marco, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Marco Galiak from Catalyst Balkans. Uh, we host CVCRM um, in Serbian countries of the region. Uh, and we also provide support to many organizations uh, in Serbia primarily. And I'm interested to hear more about the technical aspects of your solution. So that's what attracted me. Uh, I'm here with two of my colleagues, uh, Nathan Koshel and Tomas Momčilovic. So uh, maybe Thomas can introduce himself next. Sure, uh, I'm Thomas. I'm the research coordinator at the Catalyst Balkan Foundation. And I'm also a co-founder of a small scale uh, system building association that's been trying to implement a food donation delivery system uh, in Belgrade, Serbia, uh, but completely unrelated to civic catalysts. So I'm specifically interested, to, uh, sorry, to civic CRM. So I'm specifically interested to, in uh, hearing the technical implementation of uh, your project. I think Nathan's left. I'll just jump in and say, hi, I'm Nathan. Um, the director of Catalyst Balkans. Um, I'm really interested in this um, this example. In, interested in hearing how how do you go from the collection of 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 all of the cases in Civi case to uh, making purchasing decisions um, for the inventory? Um, how do you how how are you hedging? I mean, the, it's still ongoing. So how do you hedge your bets against how much to buy and how is Civi uh, Civi CRM helping you to to make those decisions beyond getting a, a collective shopping list, as it were. Cool. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, uh, I want to take uh, Joe Joe's question first um, about how we're integrating. So one of the one of the major sticking points was we we inherited this like Airtable um, Slack system from another mutual aid group and there were certain aspects of their system that we didn't get. Like they had a lot of automated bots, like populating information between the two systems. And we just didn't have that functioning on our end for a while. It was very frustrating. Um, and that's one of like one of the, the big things that city CRM sort of streamlined for us. And right now we're, we're tackling that issue of how do we integrate since we're still using Airtable to gather the requests. Um, and then, <clears throat> and then volunteers are, are putting the relevant information into the, the form, uh, tool. Um, like how do we integrate that? And that's sort of, that's sort of our, our 2.0 model is, is moving away, is just moving away from Airtable. Um, hopefully that's going to be a little bit of a longer process to like fully get ourselves extricated from Airtable. Um, because the, you know, the, the majority of our, our, our issues with that are, are just volunteers mis, um, mistyping details and us having to sort of do like a matchup thing. Um, and it's also one of our big motivators for switching to a case-based model um, is that as calls and requests come in, cases get created, um, and then we can follow those cases all the way through our own like proprietary system and not, ha not have to do a, a pencil and paper like check between Airtable and Civi CRM. Um, also, hopefully, as as people start, as we sort of start moving out of lockdown here, um, for uh, you know, we're hoping that grocery and food delivery becomes less of a a focus for the group. Like, 
it has been like i mean the situation in flatbush has been like dire for a while even before the um the outbreak in terms of food being a food desert not having access to like good quality produce um so that will always be a part of what we do um but as a mutual aid organization we also want to be able to focus on like uh tenant rights things legal assistance um cash assistance um <clears throat> um uh, like unemployment assistance, uh, senior check-ins, all the, all the other things that a good mutual aid organization can do. Um, and having, having a case-based model is going to allow us to perform several different actions for a neighbor, right? Because people who need groceries oftentimes also need a one-on-one -on -one check in, um, and like health, um, <clears throat> health check-ins for like seniors and stuff. Um, yeah, so that's, in terms of integrating Airtable, our our impetus is to sort of move move away from that um, as much as possible because it, it is it is a rather it's in some ways good in its versatility, but it is also kind of like a sprawling and and confusing tool for a lot of volunteers to use as well. Um, does yeah. yeah, that's great. Thanks. And, and, and then also for later or now, if you want, if you have time, but I'm just curious about, uh, Eric, you might know these folks, you know, uh, Dana Scalman, and other folks who were involved in Occupy and then Occupy Sandy and you know, like, like uh, aid efforts with Sandy and we're using Civi, I think. Um, did you got, do you know them, any like an overlap or stuff that uh, if they're still around, I have no idea. Um, thing, so. all of the people that were involved in that wave of mutual aid are mostly somehow involved in this one, but it's taking different forms. Um, right. you know, it's a whole different crisis. And so it's, it's, uh, it's much more neighborhood by neighborhood focused right now. Um, yeah. during Sandy, there were certain regions of the city that really were impacted more than others. And we were able to, people were focusing, you know, people in all sorts of neighborhoods of Manhattan were focused on Chinatown, um, and getting food to people who lived 20 stories up in buildings. These, uh, elevators were turned off because there was no power. Um, this situation is very different and we are all sort of locked in our own neighborhoods pretty much you know no one's taking the subway to go somewhere else um, and the integration the only real integration between Airtable and Civi right now is uh, a weekly data import for new data for volunteers and things like that which is just a straight import standard dupe checking on email and, and name um, but that's really the only integration that's happened as a manual export from Airtable into yeah. to Civi. Okay, cool. All right, great. Cool. Thanks, Jacob, as well. Yeah. Can I say one thing too, which is interesting? So, Airtable, we take the code that Airtable generates and that is pasted into uh, the Civi tool that we're using, and the phone number from Airtable is pasted into our new tool. And then at the end, we can do an export. Of, of the codes and the numbers and compare the two lists to see if we got off anywhere. And the codes, like a, like a, a, a case code basically, or? Yeah, Airtable generates a, a like, a, well, our Airtable, I think they function differently, but ours generates a four letter code that we then use in the Civi tool. And then that Airtable is a reference, becomes a reference for that case. Okay, great, thank you so much. We can also share our screen if that's easier to sort of show it. Okay. Yeah, that might be a good idea. I, I wanted to answer the question about um, how it informs our purchasing decisions as well. Eric, I don't know if you have the um, um, the port the um, the page where we were setting the portioning guidelines from the orders. So, on for my for my end of things, we have. Once, once all the volunteers, once all the volunteers fill out the um, the order form with the neighbors, it gives us uh, an order summary of like the number the number of orders um, placed, and then it also gives us an output that is number of orders placed, um, 
affected by family size as well. So like for for example, like we're getting we're getting apples in. Um and so you have we have 70 orders for apples this weekend and but 30 of those orders are for a family of five or greater and a family in our system we have a port we have a portioning guide um so when because <laughs> when we get bulk produce in it all gets split up into into like a standard size bag by our volunteers so a family of five or more will get three standard size bags of apples right so we will have one data output uh, output that tells us we need to bag 163 standard size bags of apples in order to cover the 70 requests for apples. Um, and then that will also reflect on the packing sheet that the volunteers get when they're actually packing the bags for the neighbors. Um, where, yeah, um, perfect. Yeah, so, <clears throat> um, Let's take uh, the the potatoes, right? Um, it's not it's not totally filled out yet for this week, but uh, and we can we can yeah, so we can affect we can affect like the amount. So like four pounds of potatoes for one person, six pounds of potatoes for two people, ten for three, and so on and so forth. Um, that'll print off on the packing slip for the volunteers as well, so that they they see when they're packing the actual grocery bags that they need to grab six pounds of potatoes for a two person family. Um, and this, from this, we uh, the third output is the actual like poundage of produce needed for a weekend. Um, and we can compare that uh, week to week to sort of get uh, like a running average. So we'll buy, when we're purchasing, because with, with bulk buying and wholesale, we had to place the orders at least a couple days in advance before the form is closed. So we're able to get sort of a, an average like weekly need for potatoes, right? So we know, we know after doing this for four, uh, four weeks that we need roughly 450 pounds of potatoes to get through a weekend. We can purchase those potatoes on Monday. And then by Wednesday night, we'll know whether or not we we're on, on that number. So if we had an, an exceptional uh, number of requests for potatoes or extra large families for that week, which has happened, um, especially when you're dealing kind of, we're scaled up to a point where, um, we, we can get some good averages, but it's still a small enough sample size where like the, the, the average size of the families can fluctuate. Right. So we'll know on Wednesday night if we need actually 500 pounds of potatoes. And then that gives us the lead time to find a source for the extra 50 pounds of potatoes for the weekend. So having having those those three outputs, the number of orders, the orders affected by size for creating the spec sheets for our, our our baggers who are separating the bulk goods, and then having the actual like poundage output, um, really like makes my job a breeze. Um, and that's been super super helpful. Does that answer that question about bulk buying? Yeah, and may I ask one more? I'm, I'm, I know I'm, okay. I'm just curious about whether you tried to, um, <laughs> or two questions, two, two questions. So all the, all the stuff, you're putting all the orders together, are you putting all the, the requests together and then you're doing the bulk ordering? You're not like ordering up front and then saying, okay, we got a thousand pounds of potatoes and whatever, right? What, what, what's one question? And another one is that curiosity. Are you trying to use like, QR codes, barcodes, anything to track stuff coming in and out or whatever, like, is that? Um, so uh, this is, this is a conversation. Uh, I'm going to answer the second question first, because this is, this is a conversation that me and Eric had at the beginning of this thing. Um, and from like, from a, like a warehouse perspective, like having, having the QR codes or barcodes to track inventory coming in and out of a system, makes a lot of sense uh if you're trying to get like a precise like live inventory on coming from a uh i i'm a i'm a chef i work in kitchens the idea of like con uh, of controlling a live inventory in an operation as small as ours is is a recipe for like sort of over overworking on the on the system like that the, you know 
uh, having someone like check things in and then like monitor like the quantities as they're in our system, the, the sort of the way that we've done this is to monitor the data um, of, you know, because we can say we can know how much we have coming in and we can monitor how much we have going out and then have the discrepancy between those two be our actual inventory. And that reduces the need to have volunteers dedicated to only maintaining inventory for us. And it, it takes it out, it takes it out of, it, it makes a lot less work for us than, than monitoring a live inventory. Um, and as far as the first question goes, so the tricky, the tricky part with moving to a wholesale program is, and especially, especially since we've decided if, if we wanted to, if we wanted to work with just like a standard produce supplier, who's going to get us like, um, California carrots and Mexican avocados and Canadian potatoes, um, all coming in through warehouses in Hunts Point, Bronx, like we could, we could place our orders like the day before, right. And get the delivery. But another thing that we decided to do was to work with farmers, local farmers, um, especially local farmers who are suffering because of the restaurant closures, um, who are a lot, a lot of the people that I, I typically work with in, uh, when my, my job exists, um, and, and like sort of have mutual aid be able to benefit that system as well. Um, and the trick with that is that those orders typically have to be placed since they're being harvested from the field specifically for us early. Yeah. And so we place, we place the orders on Monday or Tuesday, but we don't know our actual um, needs until Wednesday, but being able to track week to week, our averages means that we're, we're actually, we're actually fairly accurate on what we need and any access can get sit home with volunteers um, or given away. Like we haven't, I actually have, I have a, a, a 16 gallon batch of apple cider of hard cider working in my, uh, my apartment right now from a, uh, from an uh, over order on apples. So we're, we're making sure nothing goes to waste, but we're, we're actually fairly accurate. We have one person on stack. Uh, Bruno. Um, yeah. A question that I asked before we effectively started, um, that I asked about, um, whether you managed to use your civi core functionality to do all of this, or if you had to, um, to do any custom code to make it. This um, the initial, uh, iteration was all core Drupal seven and civi functionality, uh, civi web form, um, creates the orders and the cases. Um, we're moving to a slightly different model where we're going to a node-based model instead of a web form model. And for that, there's two functions in a module that needed to be written in order to create the case properly um, with the data we wanted to, and then bring back a link from the case to the node. So there, there's a note in the case that links to the node, and then there's a field in the node that links to the case. Um, that's the only custom function. Everything else is core civi volunteers, civi case, uh, and there's a lot of Drupal views involved um, in terms of doing the calculations and things like that. I believe uh, Thomas is on stack. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I was wondering, I have actually, the, let's say a two part question. The first part is uh, how much inertia have you encountered when uh, implementing this with volunteers or beneficiaries implementing this system? Uh, and uh, as far as I understand, you don't have uh, traditional suppliers in terms of uh, formal companies or whatever providing the food uh, in donation form or in whichever form, but you have a, a sort of a local supplier system. I'm sorry if I'm not, uh, if I'm not uh, using the terminology right, but is there also any inertia in terms of the user interface uh, or in terms of the, just the general use that suppliers also um, have uh, in whatever form they, they take? I'll take the first part and then I'll pass it to you all to talk about the suppliers. Um, yeah, a uh, lot of friction. 
lot of resistance. Um, introducing new tools is really difficult. Um, one of the things about Civi is, you know, it's got an older looking interface. Um, it's not as fancy as Airtable. Um, and there's some resistance that we've found because of things like that. Um, but for the most part, once people start have started to use the system, they've started to realize that those other things don't matter, that the functionality and the, the way that it's facilitating their ability to actually do the human to human contact uh, has lowered that, that resistance. Um, but getting people to that point has still been very difficult. Can I just ask a follow-up? Uh, are there instances uh, in your current experience where people are trying to uh, go around the system? So they acknowledge the system in terms of it's useful, it, uh, you know, we can implement it, but are there like ways that uh, people try to uh, take shortcuts to fix the problem more quickly in their, in their view or in their kind of approach to it? Yeah, sort of, there's, there's so many facets to this organization um, that yes, there's a lot of things moving in different directions like that where people just are like, oh, I'm gonna do, use proprietary system X to just push this forward. That's why the, the food and the bulk buying is where uh, the tech team is really focused at this point because that's the subgroup that has been receptive to this. And slowly, we're, we're inching out into other parts of the organization. We're bringing, like bringing in uh, the ability to send out civvy mail to volunteers and to group volunteers by their interest and send out civvy mail um, is something that has enticed certain other people to start being willing to use the system and not, not just throw other solutions together. So. But yeah, there's always going to be resistance like that, especially in such an ad hoc, no one has power uh, to tell anybody what to do and make decisions kind of organization. Making decisions is impossible. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, just, I just want to add on to that. I, I actually want Amy to comment on this um, because there's a, definitely a huge difference between the inertia from the admin planning side versus the actual like volunteers on the ground side. Yeah, I will say that it's been a huge game changer for us. I was training volunteers who were just giving up after, after one try because it was about, our initial system was about matching one individual family's request to a shopper. And it was incredibly stressful, especially if they were, if, if the family was based far away, then you had to find, you know, you were hoping that someone would pick up this request who might have to drive pretty far. And so, and then you had to keep continually checking back. What's great about this new system is that the volunteers know for 100% we are going to guarantee this delivery on the weekend. So it takes a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the pressure, a lot of the guest work out of it. And it's also a lot easier to use. It's much more user friendly than trying to post on Slack and then change the icons and then remember to update here. And so it's, it's from a volunteer perspective, I think we're doing a lot better in terms of retaining our volunteers because it is easier to use and it is more efficient. Are we, are we supposed to be heading back to the uh, main room now? All right. Yeah, I think we are. Did anyone have any other questions? Yes, yes. I, I would like, could, could we talk a little bit about this civic case thing? For example, do you have a good documentation for people that have a basic knowledge in CVCIM that then could work with CVKs? Um, there is some documentation on the CV site for CVKs, but it's pretty small. It's pretty, mm -hmm. um, and so it's mostly, I have not written any documentation. And just one other thing to point out is that in how I, the, the worker cooperative that I'm a part of in my day job, um, we do civvy and development for nonprofit organizations. That's what we do. Um, and the perspective we bring to it is often we want to remove people's interaction with civvy CRM 
while using Civi CRM as the data store because it is very efficient and it can do all of these things. And so a lot of the user interface is actually Drupal views um, that is pulling data out of Civi CRM into a, a more familiar format for people with fewer items on the page, fewer things to look at, uh, fewer confusing buttons to click. Um, but with CiviCase, the goal is to move some people eventually into using the CiviCase interface because the new CiviCase interface is, is pretty nice. Um, and it will provide just an easier way of them keeping track of uh, what they're responsible for. But in the most part, it the goal is to keep all that in kind of user dashboards on the CRMs um, on the CMS side. Uh, Would you also share your email address for questions to CV case or or not? <laughs> there it is. It's in the chat. Oh, uh, feel free much. to get in touch. I'll you know maybe I can help. Maybe I can't. But yeah, you know yeah. I'll do what I can. It, it's you know. Yeah, that's the beauty you. of the community. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, may I have another question? Sure, um, one more and then I think we're done. Okay. Um, talking about the volunteers and you said, oh, difficult with systems. Uh, um, before I just said, we just bring people together and then they do the job. So they call and say, okay, what sh shall I buy for you at the grocery? Um, so they had practically nothing to do with 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 big system. Of course, we, we didn't buy at farmers so that other people could 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 get something could get something to eat. But um, what what made you made you choose this way? So buying all big quantities and then send it out to people and not let them decide on an individual basis who needs what, and then the volunteer just simply goes to the store and gets it and brings it back. What, what was your, why didn't, why did you go this way? Cost, cost and volume. We were talking oh. about thousands and thousands of, of requests in our neighborhood. Oh, and, okay. and, um, at, at our, at our, at our former pace and cost, we we're, it was not sustainable in any way, shape or form. So we developed, we developed these tools to find a sort of like happy medium between we didn't want to dictate what people had to eat. You know, we live in a very culturally diverse neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, so we developed, we, we did a bunch of research on commonly requested items and developed an inventory from, uh, from those commonly requested items and keeping in mind the, the various cultural like backgrounds of the people we were serving uh, to come up with our inventory. Um, so they don't, you know, they don't have to, if someone doesn't like green plantains, they don't have to get green plantains. They, they just, they can, they opt out of that. Um, and, and we still, we still buy some items individually for people as well. So we're able to serve, you know, a, a number of people a magnitude greater than we were before with our system without having to force them into a food pantry, like charity model. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of the idea that we want to expand on that is to be, is, you know, there's also room for growth in that model rather than just like creating more, more bags of food for, for more people is like creating more diversity in our selections using, using the power of community to, uh, to create purchasing power so that we can go and get better deals from farmers and, mm -hmm. and find more variety. Um, for, ex for example, we got feedback from the community that Kalaloo leaves uh, would be a good, <clears throat> like a good addition, and we were able to find a a, fir a first generation um, immigrant owned farm that was growing cow leaves that was able to sell it to us in our price point because we were buying in bulk. So that's that was kind of the impetus was that we we can do we can do more we can do more good well with this system than if we went to a food pantry system or if we stayed on the individual purchases system. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can I say something about the question that's come up about suggested donation? 
this has been really successful for us. We, we do ask in the script when we sign people up to bulk buy, we say, you know what, we're just neighbors helping neighbors. There's a lot of people in need now. If you have a couple of extra dollars and you can give those dollars to your delivery volunteer, that's going to help pay for the next family's set of groceries. And obviously not everybody can do that, but there's plenty of people that can. And sometimes it ranges from $5 to $20. And then that money we use as a runner's float for if we're short, if items are short the next day, or we need to go out for something unexpected. So it is helping to buy the next neighbor's groceries. And what we found is people really love to be part of this bigger initiative. So they're not just passively receiving aid, but they're also helping others in the community. So it's definitely possible to do a suggested donation or to ask people to contribute. And that's what we do. I think they're probably missing us back in the main room. So um, yeah. Thank you Thanks guys. all for the great questions. Um, continue the conversations on whatever forums and formats we can.